Hello, I'm Franz Spohn, and I'm here at Faber-Castell to introduce you to their new Try It box. And in this case, we're going to do wet mediums. Okay, the first thing, I have a very informative little newsletter type things, and it really highlights um, Faber-Castell's commitment to a green culture sustainable forestry and preserving um, animals. Also talks about the economy of using responsible materials. And you can read that and get a lot of information about the company itself. And then we will take the veil away and here are the supplies that you get. You have a collapsible water cup and so that unfolds, put water in it, has a nice little kind of edge that you can rest your brushes on. Uh, watercolor pencils, tube watercolor, a black dual tip uh, watercolor pen, and a water brush. So this is a specific watercolor paper and they're uh, number of brands, a number of uh, quality tiers that you can work with, but you want to make sure that you get a paper that has been formulated specifically for watercolor to get the best results. So I especially would not use uh, inkjet or any other kind of like laser paper, something thin. Uh, the paper is usually um, sized and sizing in a paper protects the fibers from absorbing too much of the material and with watercolor especially or any water soluble material the purpose of the sizing is to give you a chance if you look at it and say oh man that's a little bit too dark you can pick some of the pigment up because it has been sized uh, paper that does not have sizing which is re referred to as water leaf as soon as you put pigment in especially the liquid pigment, the fibers of the paper will absorb that uh, pigment and you got to work with it. <laughs> so uh, the sizing, the more sizing, the more time you have to be able to pick up or move around or lighten the color. Okay, the first material I want to work with is the Gold Faber Aqua Dual Marker. It has a brush pen, on one side and then it has a fine tip on the other. It's water soluble and they come in 48 colors. Okay so we'll use the brush first and you can the the quality of the tip is that I can use very little pressure and I can get a line and the same thing will happen with the fixed tip end of it but no matter how hard I press or uh, what I do with it, this is going to be a consistent line. The advantage of the brush is that it can be reflective of the gesture and the energy in which you're applying things. So this way it has much more of a brush quality and a fluidness that you would not get if you're using the other end. Now what is nice about the other end, on the other hand, is that you can use it in combination with the brush tip in order to maybe do a little bit of cross hatching or you can start to get a little value in here or more detailed lines. And then obviously, I mean this is black, and so with the full range of the 48 colors that you would have available to you, that you could be doing this with all sorts of colors and you could put the color in there. But right now we just want to focus, let's say, on, on the one color on the black. Now this is the water brush. And <clears throat> I generally have like a scrap piece of paper off to the side that I use. Um, in this case though, I kind of want you to see everything that's going on, so I'm going to use my watercolor pad. But if I squeeze that a little bit, I get the water. Uh, to come out of the brush and this is really handy and I also find that these brushes are extremely handy if I'm going somewhere on airport so I just once I get through security I fill the, the pen up and then I'm set to go 
if I have water uh, soluble pencils and markers with me. But in this case, I put a you know, pretty good concentration of that black pigment down. And now what I'm gonna do is just very lightly go over the lines and now I get these washes. And you can see how incredibly pigmented these are. No pun intended on me doing a pig here. But yeah, pigmentation is very important and all Faber-Castell materials are heavily pigmented. And you can see that, you know, I'm just barely even touching that and it immediately does what it's supposed to do. It liberates the pigment and now you start to get more of a wash feeling. Okay, so if I think that, okay, that's, I don't want it to get too dark, I can come back and clean it. And again, if you have a scrap piece, then you, know, you can preserve your, <clears throat> your artwork. And then when I come back, then it might be a little bit lighter. And what I do is try to get a pool of pigment so I can move it around and I can manipulate it. And then if you have a paper towel, something that's absorbent, if I look at something and think, well, that's a little bit too much pigment, I can, because of the sizing in the paper, you can see how that, all that stuff that used to be there just lifted right off. So then I can, uh, other thing that you can do is that you can use uh, something for a palette. Um, you know, if you have a palette, disposable palette that's waxed, wax paper, if you have a plastic flat dish, something, you could use that. But this stays water soluble, so I can come back and actually then apply it specifically with my brush. So if I want to kind of beef up some of those lines, make them look more like a, a brush um, with a little bit of kind of manipulation of the wash, then I can do that. Um, again, with the brush, I could kind of come back and I can make some lines with it. And if I like the way that things are going, then I can take the cap off and then I can come back when it's dry um, and maybe add some more. I mean, well, it's wet too. I mean, you can do wet into wet techniques as well, but if you don't want this line to bleed, if you want these lines to be a little bit crisper, then you wait for the paper to dry. All right, next up, we have watercolor pencils. And there are a few features that I'd like to discuss about that. These come in a total of 60 colors. You have six of them. And those colors are, and I'll give you the, the numbers because that is a significant thing. Uh, number 107, cadmium yellow, right here. Then we have a number 15, 115, dark cadmium orange. And then we have 123, which is a fuchsia. Okay. And then we have a middle purple, number 125. And then we also have uh, emerald green which is number 163 and a light blue, number 147. Now, one of the things I'll, I'll point out here that the, um, these three colors, the blue, uh, the fuchsia, and the yellow are very close to process colors. And you can make just about any color combination you want with these three pencils, but it helps to have some other ones as well, and we'll get into color mixing in just a minute. But uh, one of the features of these pencils, we were mentioning color, in the entire set of 60 colors, with the pigments, the, the number is important because if you want to match that perhaps with a soft pastel, if you're doing some multimedia thing, or if you want to use a regular non-water soluble color pencil, they have uh, what's called index color system where they use the same pigment in all the products, whether it's a pastel, watercolor paint, um, watercolor pencil, markers, whatever. Um, they all have the same pigment if they have like number 140 that is always going to be consistent through the whole range. So that way if you're involved with multimedia projects then you can match up those colors without having like one blue look like it doesn't even belong to the other blue. So you can really come up with a very nice system of uh, color. Uh, 
they're also made uh, to last. The leads are highly pigmented. They have um, light, fast uh, archival quality to them. Uh, they're very soft. You can use them, as you'll see when I draw with them, you can use them as a regular color pencil, but the bonus is that they're also water soluble. And what's really important, um, a lot of times if you're using pencils, the leads will start either breaking or falling out of them when you try to sharpen them. Those is not going to happen. That's not going to happen with these pencils because they have what is a SV bonding. So uh, the way the pencils are made, the lead are sandwiched between wooden slats and then they're formed down to be the hexagonal shape that you're familiar with. But in the process, most pencils are just spot glued. So you have a little bit of glue to hold the lead in and a little bit of glue and a little, all of Faber-Castell's pencils are glued across the whole edge. So that means if you accidentally dra drop one of these things and the lead breaks somewhere in between glue spots in other pencils, you would just lose all the lead until you get to the next glue spot. And that could eat up uh, quite a bit of your your pencil by just having the legs, lead, uh, lids fall out. But with the Faber-Castell pencils, because they're glued along the whole way, um, you will not notice that there is a breakage. Even if you do have a break when you're sharpening it, you're gonna go well beyond that and everything else is nice and solid. You don't have to be looking for the next um, glue spot. So that makes them uh, last quite a bit longer than uh, other pencils and they're very soft and so I will you know, kind of show you how great these are. When I look at these pencils, I'm going to put um, a heavier concentration in one. And one of the, uh, now that I'm working with a pencil on the watercolor paper, you can see how kind of pebbly it is. It has a texture. Now you can get either what's called a cold press finish which is like this, it has a texture, or a hot pressed, a hot press finish, which is just a can, extra process where they expose the paper to a really hot, smooth platen, and so it kind of, it's like ironing paper, so it makes it into a real smooth um, surface. It's up to you to decide whether you want a hot press or cold press. I, especially with using pencils, I like the cold press, press paper because I can take advantage of the texture. All right, so we have a heavier concentration, a lighter concentration. So I'll take my water brush. Again, I'm gonna squeeze a little bit out just to kind of prime it. Now, as soon as this hits the pencils, you can see like immediately there's just an explosion of color. So these, uh, the formulation of the leads makes them highly, uh, a high performance that they do what they're supposed to do. Now I'm gonna just kind of take some of that off and then continue with uh, clear water again. So I can get a nice gradation in my color wash here from the really heavy into a lighter. And of course, if I keep on going back and forth and using some pressure on the barrel of the pen, I get even more diluted solution. Now, whether it's regular watercolor, whether watercolor pencils, what I recommend doing is trying to preserve the white of the paper. So instead of then having something that's too dark in an area, um, I don't want to have to try to figure out if I use a white or something to lighten that up, then it's going to look a lot different uh, than the rest of it. And the really nice quality of watercolor, whether it's with the pencils or the tubes, the white of the paper comes through and it gives it kind of a glowing luminescence to it. And so I try to preserve that as much as I can. All right, so <clears throat> all the colors will do the same thing. Now the one thing you might notice that I'm kind of holding on to the pencil near the end. I'm not writing somebody a letter. So, you know, this is a good grip to have if you're doing numbers or if you're writing somebody a letter or something like that. But what I do is I hold the pencil farther away uh, from the point and then that way I can use very little pressure if I want a real light deposit of the pigment on the paper or I can use a little more pressure and bear down a bit more. And so I have a lot more control 
of the tonality so I can have very dense, very solid areas. And then as I lighten the pressure up and pretty much just go with the weight of the pencil itself, then I have smaller areas. So if you're working on real subtle uh, changes from the intensity of the pigmentation to you know something that's a little bit lighter, then it's you can achieve that a lot more efficiently if you kind of hold on to the pencil more from the end of it instead of a, a regular writing pencil grip. All right, now let's kind of talk a little bit about uh, mixing colors because, you know, in your kit, you'll have six pencils and so you're probably going to do something that might require a little bit more of a color range and so you can use the pencils themselves in order to um, make new colors. And there, there are several ways we can do it. We'll do it several different ways, all right? So I've got that there. And then let's see what happens when we mix it with the blue. And we'll put a little section here. And then let's do one where we have the two on top of each other. Okay. So you can see even visually, we've got the blue, we've got the magenta fuchsia color, and on top of each other, then you have a purplish cast to it. So um, these two will make the purple, and these do the same thing with the yellow and the green, or yellow and the blue, or whatever. Okay, so let's take our brush, and I'll go over here. I got this color. All right, come over, get the blue. come over and kind of get this more purplish color. All right, let's move into the two watercolors. And these are equally as heavily pigmented. Um, they're beautiful. They really uh, work well with the pencils or simply by themselves. Uh, we have light blue. Number 147, we've got cadmium yellow 107. That's one of my favorite colors. I have that number memorized. We have the uh, uh, emerald green, which is the number 153. And we have the uh, uh, medium purple pink, which is more of kind of like a um, magenta color, number 125. Now, <clears throat> the liquid watercolor paints come in 24 colors, but this is a really good selection because with the magenta, the yellow, and the blue, then you can pretty much make uh, any combination of color. So it's really good to have just as a starter to kind of uh, experiment and see what you can do with them. Okay, so um, let's start with the magenta, or actually the, the middle purple. And again, you can use like a, you know, there are a lot of little plastic dishes that are made specifically for mixing paints. You could use, um, you know, like enamel pan, any kind of surface, wax paper, disposable palettes. But um, so you can really see what's going on. I'm going to just put it on my paper here because I'm just experimenting. This is a finished piece. Um, before. I did this, um, you'll see that they're sealed with a little piece of aluminum. Um, you gotta pry that off, but that uh, means that nothing's gonna leak or ooze in shipment, and it keeps them fresh until you're ready to use them. But, you know, just, you'll have to take that off, obviously. And, all right, so I'm gonna use my water brush again, and then just maybe over here in the corner, just so you can kind of see, um, I'm working that around a little bit. You can see how intense that color is. And then by the same token, if I kind of clean my brush for a second and just use the water out of the, um, the pen here, I can pick a little of that and you can see how even in the diluted phase, then it has a, a, a nice presence. So you can go into something um, that is practically right out of the tube for intense colors. And then as I go into that, you can see the way it's starting to spread out. And when that dries, then you can have these watercolor washes that are quite nice, especially if you're trying to, like if you're working with flowers or something like that, then that could be a very nice texture. In fact, as I look at this, if I kind of bring it out a little bit, it almost looks like a, a flower right there. So 
All right, clean that off, and then let's look at the blue. Okay. You may find that um, when you first use them, there's just a tiny bit of clear vehicle. So when you put it down the first time, you can move it around. That mixes it up. We'll get the yellow. And then we. All right, so here's the blue, and this is what it looks like when it's pretty much right out of the tube, and then I'll squirt a little water on it, and you can see, similar to this one, that it makes a very nice uh, intermediate tone. It's clear, when that dries, you get a little bit of spot, and it picks up the texture of the paper. All right, let's try the yellow. The yellow is very vibrant. And then I'll, again, I'll get it to thin out a little bit. So you got, you know, thinned out, more full strength. And then let's get the green. Okay, that's the full strength. And then let's get some water onto it. And then it also gets to be a nice. Okay, so let's uh, play with the color a little bit. I'm gonna take a little bit of the magenta with my brush. I'll put it down there. And I like to dip the, the pen into the water just to clean the brush. And then if I need more water to dilute, then I just gently squeeze it and I'll get a little bit. Or if I want it to be really diluted, I'll use quite a bit of pressure on it. Okay, so not surprisingly, when I mix those two colors, which would correspond to our, our pencil watercolor, uh, watercolor pencils uh, color, if I want to make it a little darker, and then go over it with a little more blue. I can kind of keep on picking it up until I mix a color that I like. So I'm going to start off with the four colors. Now we have a fifth color here. All right, let's check out uh, what happens when we take some of the yellow. Uh, just maybe take a little bit more. Okay, now we're going to start picking up some blue. So let's start off maybe with a little light blue and we'll put it down here. So you get like a real nice kind of pale green. And then if I use uh, close to equal strength up here, I get a darker green. Now it's kind of a blue green because I have more blue than yellow. So I can always come back and pick up some more yellow here and make that into very bright spring green. And so when I look at that, then we can come back up and through here. Let's uh, take it a slight, well, yeah, maybe let's pick it up and put it next to the hair. So you can see that the green that I'm making here could be a little bit more yellowish, uh, a little bit brighter. So, you know, I can get a green out of the tube or I can, you know, continue to work with layering um, different saturations of the yellow and the blue together to get a green, um, you know, in order to get close to that. And there's no reason why, if that's a little bit too dark, that's a little bit too light, then I can take a little of that and add some of this. And then I have something that's gonna be in between. You know, I could just add a little more yellow to it. That's a really nice, more like kind of a St. Patrick's Day green. Um, if I want to create kind of a gray color, I can come in and take, you know, essentially the green, and this is kind of like a red and a kind of a green. Those are complementary colors, so that if I add just a little bit of the uh, middle purple, or what to me looks like magenta, if I add a little of that to the green, it's going to make it into a green, but it's going to be more of kind of a gray color, because that when you add two primary colors, um, together the opposite colors um, then you get a graying effect so instead of being bright if you want to tone something down just add a little bit of the complementary color to it you know, so that's um, you can experiment with wet uh, washes you can uh, I mentioned traveling on an airplane what I like doing is maybe taking a scrap piece of paper and then you can make a little palette little dabs of the colors 
And then if you let that dry, instead of these being liquid watercolors, they become more like a pan watercolor. And then if you have your water brush with you, then when you're on the other side of uh, airport security, you can put water in your water brush and then you can bring one of these out and it's like having a little mini uh, set of watercolors with you uh, that are more like, you know, the dried uh, pan type of uh, approach to it. And once that dries, they're still so capable of becoming watercolor that I just have to take my watercolor brush. I mean, they're not uh, dry yet, obviously, but the idea then is that if I just kind of go over it with my brush, I can pick that as the source and then in my sketchbook or something that I can start working with them. Okay, our next uh, project is going to be using the materials in kind of a more multimedia fashion. So I do um, a lot of little renderings. I love drawing toys. And so I brought one of my uh, old fashioned Fisher Price toys in. And um, so you can see what it looks like. And I chose this, um, you know, I often choose these type of things to, to demonstrate with, because basically these wood shapes are more geometric shapes. They're not quite as complex. Like if you try to do an animal realistic or whatever, then you've got all sorts of subtle things to do. But with these, you know, they're essentially basic shapes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off um, and I'm going to kind of sketch very lightly. I'm going to use um, this light blue and I'll talk a little bit about how I might analyze a shape like this. So it's got a round head. That's pretty easy. Okay. And so within this, I kind of look to see where the axis is. And so I kind of think, all right, he's tilting his head like that. And so if I have the hat, I break it down also into shapes. So this is about where it is on the head. So I'll do a little light ellipse in through there. And then it's got a bigger brim on top and tapers up. So I'll kind of do that. And I'm always kind of aware of the axes, uh, axes or, okay, then up here, it's kind of conformed to the shape of the head when the hat would go on it. So I'll come up here and it's like a little cylinder. And on top of it, it's got a slightly indented kind of cone, truncated show, uh, cone shape. So again, I'm kind of looking the center of the hat is here. The center is here. The center down below is here. So if I have a very light axis line sketched, then I can make sure that all of that more or less works together. Okay, so I've got that. And then this, this is kind of like the center axis for the head. Maybe I'll just, just draw kind of a cutaway. So this goes around in through here. Then I can kind of see where the eyes are positioned. So here is a circle for an eye here. This one is a little farther away from me and a little bit on the side, so it's more of an elliptical shape. And then if I go from the center here and go down here, this is a space that is midway between those, and then I can kind of get an idea of where the end of the nose is, and I'll put it in through there. And then it comes and attaches here, and then I'll do a little sketch here. All right, so I've got the beginning of um, my duck head and then I look at the little kind of daisy collar here and you know it, it's it's flexible so one of them is kind of but I'm, I'm going to be going to this point so if I looked at where that is it's kind of pointing in there and I put another one that is uh, sticking out a little farther so it's going to look a little bit shorter but it actually is kind of foreshortened and then this one, again, I'm going to that center there. So you want everything to kind of stay symmetrical. Um, you have a, another one that is kind of flopping down. And you have these that are kind of out through here. But if you keep on thinking how the center of each of those kind of petal shapes has to go, the center of them have to go to the center, 
of the head itself, then it really kind of draws itself. I mean, you don't have to be guessing at it. I mean, you have an end point, like right underneath the nose about here. So I know that that's got to come there and go to the center. And then I've got one more that's kind of sticking out here. All right, so you can kind of get that idea. Then the neck comes down. And again, on that axis, it's attached symmetrically. So there was this neck and there's a little kind of beaded thing on the end of it. Now it's got kind of like this slightly barreled shape. And so if I look at where, all right, the end of it, you know, it kind of comes to the shoulder here, comes down like that. And then I can't really see the front of it, but it's, it's tapered a little bit. So I can kind of put that in. All right, um, all right, so at this point, I'm going to say, okay, this is kind of the end of him. And tapers in a bit. This is the bottom of the barrel. This kind of comes up and then it curves over. This comes and then curves a little bit more that way. And then real quick, I'm going to just, I'm not going to belabor this. Okay, so then there's a wheel there. He's got these kind of goofy little paddles for wings. That blocks my vision of the wheel underneath. And then I follow through to where it has to come out on that end. And I'll make it just a little bit smaller. This one is tilted in a slightly different direction. Okay. So that, you know, is more or less, oh, I, I can see just a little bit of the wheel up here. All right, so I've got it kind of sketched in. And, you know, I can think a little bit about where the shadow is as well. Okay, so once I have that, then let's start with, uh, let's start with the cap. All right. And so I'm going to put some of that middle purple down. And then to make it more kind of a red, instead of kind of a magenta pink color, I put a little yellow down. I'll take my brush and maybe over here, I'll put a little of that. And I'll pick some of the yellow up. See, that's getting closer to what I'm thinking about in terms of a nice red. And then, again, with watercolor, it isn't like an opaque acrylic paint. You want to take advantage of its transparency. So I want to make sure that that's got uh, plenty of juice to it. I want it to be nice and bold, but I also want to make sure that uh, it stays to be like a watercolor. Okay, so over that. And you could also do the preliminary drawing with a light uh, drawing pencil. Okay, so that has kind of an orange cast to it. So when that dries, I'll probably go back over it with a little more um, magenta or the middle purple. Okay, so now let's get, um, let's go for the, the head. Put the rest of the hat in. That was my. Let me get a little more yellow. A little more yeah. Yeah. Totally forgot about the top part of the hat, or the bottom part, I guess it is. Okay, at this point, I'm just kind of putting the mid-tone in and trying to kind of preserve the white if there are any kind of highlights. Now, actually, the nose itself is orange, so we'll maybe go back with uh, this, but perhaps put it in just a little bit lighter. So got that. OK, 
Okay, the body is kind of a bluish green turquoise. So blue definitely, and we'll add just a touch of yellow to turn it into more kind of a Go. We're going to, okay, again, we'll just add a little bit of, okay, now I've got a good fluid amount there, so I can just lay it right in there. And if I look at it, I mean, I think this is pretty close to what I want, but in case it's a little too dark, again, you can use your paper towels to lighten things up a little bit. You can pick some of the pigment up instead of have it be quite so intense and again that's the sizing in the paper that allows you to do that okay so i, I want to try to keep it liquid and flowing and then i can have more of kind of a less of a texture all right and now what i'm doing when i apply the paint i kind of this is like a rounded shape so i'm using the brush to kind of reinforce that it isn't a flat shape. So I'll get, you know, if I have any marks at all, it'll be more kind of like a rounded thing to help. Okay. All right, now let's see some red wheels. Let's make those a little bit more pink. So they, I think that would look a little bit nicer here. So here are the wheels. One here. And then one of them is up here sticking out a little bit. Maybe not quite as much as I put it. So as I develop it, you know, I'm just kind of reacting to the colors that I want. You don't have to be a slave to whatever your object is. Okay, now uh, the eyes, um, the obvious thing to do with the eyes is now to engage my black watercolor pen here. And this one is a little bit more like, like that. Once you get the pupils in there, once they get their eyeballs set together, it works nicely. Okay, now the neck down here is um, black. So what I'm going to do is put some black in some of the area here. And there's a highlight on the top part of this little kind of beaded part. So I'm going to avoid putting it there. Okay, and then it's black and through there. And I know that I'm gonna be able to activate that black marker with my uh, water pen. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna draw the pigment. And then this will help give it a little more of a dimension where the highlight, you know, there's light coming in from this direction and so the bottom here will be more in shadow. And so I can kind of move the tones around a little bit so it creates a feeling for a shadow. Although I just realized I covered up one of my petals, but that's okay. We'll get that to work out. Okay, now by the same token, if I want like gray to get some form on here, I can just uh, pick up some of the extra pigmentation from here and use it as a gray. So that way, you know, if I do want to kind of get a little bit of rendering on the um, petals, this collar, Okay, those a little bit farther away and down in the shadows and then as it evolves and comes up then this is going to be also a little bit more below the surface. Actually maybe I could kind of, this probably will work. 
Let's see if I can pick that up. There we go. We get our So like magic, we have that pedal back. Let's make that a little darker in through there. Okay, that works. Now I'm going to make this maybe a little bit darker than it actually is because it'll help get the, the head to kind of pop out. You know, so if you have something darker and you have something wider around that edge, it's going to pop out. So that works. And then I'm going to get that to come out a little bit. Work with a pencil so I'll get a little bit of blue in that shadow. Down here, I can get a little more in the paddle. Um, this edge is away from the light, so it's a little bit darker, and that'll help separate it from everything. And then on the side here, I've got the shadow. And then coming into here, I've got a shadow, because this is dished out a little bit. Okay, so I got that. And over here, it's a little bit darker. That's kind of in through here. And that's over there. All right, so it's it's starting to evolve nicely. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know just to kind of speed this up a little bit, so I can start working on it with the pencils. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of pat it so it dries a little bit faster because I don't want to work on this with the pencils before the watercolor I've just done um, ends up there. So what I can do though, while I'm kind of waiting for that to dry, let's um, go back and kind of work on this shadow here. Now I have the choice I could keep the texture that I get by laying the pencil down on top of this tone and just use this as a color pencil or let's um, maybe put just a little more color in here so it's a different than just a straight blue and maybe even put some yellow in there to kind of get some interesting color blends in the shadow. The shadow doesn't always have to be just solid black. And then I can come in through here if I want and put the shadow in using the pencils. Feather it out a little bit. Again, no pun. I'm dealing with a duck here, so feathering is unnatural. Okay, so. We'll let that dry for just a moment, and then once it's dry, I will start finishing it off with the pencils. All right, so anyhow, I'm looking at my duck here. Um, a lot of times I'll actually focus a little light to get uh, real pronounced highlights and shadows, because then you can look at the shape of the shadows and the highlights to help um, give form to what you're drawing. But so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start to model that a little bit. And from the view that I have, the bottom is away from the light, so it's a little bit darker. So I can start getting a little more detail because I've got the point. And again, I'm not drawing like that. I'm trying to just lay use just enough pressure to get the pigment from the pencil to lay on the paper and you can see that that lighter tone with water the whole paper even the bottom little valleys of the the texture have been pigmented so that if i go over this with a pencil then i get a little bit of uh, color coming through it so it isn't like a solid thing now over here 
I mean, I can use enough pressure that I can get rid of all that texture, or at least most of it. But I like taking advantage of the texture of the watercolor paper. And this one, maybe I'll make it, uh, since it's a little bit darker, and then that way, when I start kind of working into what that shape is and how to model it. Now this is this is a curve. So um, what I want to do is start, and the way that the shadow will work is that it will blend in a way that gives you a feeling that it is a curve. And again, if you're doing something that's just more patterned, more geometric, more abstract, there are certainly other ways of using, you know, combinations of these materials. Like instead of trying to make something look like a toy duck, it could just be a really interesting pattern of shapes and colors um, that you've developed. So don't feel like you're obligated to suddenly turn into a photo realist. Um, you know, play with it and find out how you want to approach your work. But the materials are so flexible and they are so highly pigmented and the quality is premium. So it gives you lots of options of what you could be doing. All right, so I think actually that is more of that shape. Yeah, underneath here, it's gonna be a little bit darker. And now, as we get into where the wheels are, that's also darker. And if I make that part of the body darker, it's gonna help get that little flipper that is his wing to pop because it's going to be nice and bright and white. Okay, now I'm using, in order to get more pressure to really get rid of that texture, because I'd like that part to be very intense and dark. A little more pressure. Now as I come up, I can get it to start to, you know, because of, this is a rounded cylindrical shape, then it's going to go from dark, and as it goes up to the top where the light is, you're going to get a transition from dark to light. Okay, so what we have here now so far is we did the preliminary layer with the liquid watercolor out of the tubes and mix some colors for that. And now I'm starting to tighten the drawing up a little bit with uh, a pencil. So let's get, um, let's get his nose going here with an orange one. And again, you know, it's uh, underneath his hat there. It's a little bit darker. And at the end, it's away from the light so it's darker too. So just with a little bit of, of touch up with the pencils in combination with the paints and because they're related in the color pigmentation, they share you know similar pigments, then you can get that to blend in very nicely. Okay, when that dries, then, you know, I can always come back and add some more, maybe, you know, I want to try to get some kind of that yellowish color to go on these little kind of leafy things around the neck. And you see that, you know, the goal is the more that I'm doing here, the better it gets, but you also want to make sure that you don't end up and overdo something so it just um, doesn't have a, a freshness anymore, so. But that's all going to be a uh, part of you getting these kits, opening them up and trying them out and see what they can do for you.